Now, what about things that like you said? There's a lot of social backing and forth thing mm-hmm. between the families. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, would you phone ahead, or how would you no know? No phone. So you had no phone. No phone. They would just so, come. So, how did you get messages? Well, after a while, people got to find out that uh, Uncle Ditto and Tati Andre they like to come here on a Tuesday. So Tuesday, the upper six, the car used to park outside uh-huh. there, and then we had the priest. Every Wednesday for dinner. Every Wednesday for dinner. <laughs> the priest. And the priest used to go to Daddy uh, Andre on for Monday. dinner on a Monday or I summer see. day. Yes. So yes. it was all scattered. And then the Dabadis was, Leon Dabadi was on a, say, a Friday. Right. It was all, after a while, it all fell into a place. A nice routine. Yeah. 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 And every, every place was cocktails. Cocktails. And more cocktails. So a little, a little rum cocktail. Yeah. And you had to swig it in one. All the time. Ah. One of the roles for women was to run the local harvest festival. Once a year, yeah. they had a harvest to get, get money for the school because the schools then were run by the church and for the church and whatnot. So all the, the, the ladies of the district made the lunch and they had a delightful lunch with the best desserts and everything else. And then after the um, harvest then, there was a cricket pitch at the back. So the Port of Spain people would play against the country people. Uh-huh. And they'd have a big cricket match there. A and lot of competition. A lot of competition. Yeah. So it was a great day, yeah. especially for the villagers and so on. Mm. So everybody club. joined And then in. we had brand tubs and this and that, you know. So it was a great yes. time for yeah. them. It, it, was, it, was, it was a day that mm-hmm. the villagers got in the closest contact to mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. managerial uh-huh. the Right, lovely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What you remember what what kinds of food? Oh we yes, saw? they used to have <laughs> all kinds of food. All sorts of um chicken ass peaks and what they used to have on roast pork and and desserts because everybody made the most delicious desserts. desserts Mochas yes. and tipsies and <laughs> everything. Well and they were made by the by because the they were made, hungry man. <laughs> they were made yeah. By the um, the ladies of Montreal. Right. Yes. yes so everybody so. was wanting to be the, the right. best dessert. Right. Yes. Cocktails, desserts, polo, and tennis under the salmon tree, idyllic. Yes, but founded on a lot of hard work, on the part not only of the estate laborers, but also the French Creole overseers and managers. Can you tell us something about the um, the life of your father as a a young pioneering estate owner? Well, my father had uh, a hard time there, and he was sent to a, to a Coco estate in uh, Rio Claro, which was close to his, um, to Tonton Jean de Verteuil's uh, estate, and, uh, and, and worked there for five years as an overseer under pretty rough conditions. I, I recall my father describing his life there, and it was pretty rough. I mean, you were going to bed all hours of the night, you were the last man to bed, and the first man up in the morning. And you woke up in, in the morning, and, and, and the first thing you did was to, to zap off all the, uh, all, all the matutu falaises uh, that, that were on the mosquito net. And he got into, uh, he got malaria, he got every bloody thing under the sun, poor fellow, and nearly died. And then, and then he came to work in, uh, in Mayaro, and uh, worked there also as an overseer. But it was a hard life, you know, getting to, uh, even to getting to Port of Spain was a, was a hassle. You know, the, 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 uh, you traveled on the beach, uh, you went inland at, at the Ottawa River, you crossed the Ottawa River on a ferry, you went back on, on the beach and for the whole Manzanilla stretch, or uh, then you came back in for the, for the Nariva, to cross the Nariva River. And then, but, uh, so he, he really had a hard life. And sometimes, no matter how hard you work, the price of copper and cocoa would drop on the world market and bills were left unpaid. Now, Basil, you left school at 15. There's a little story before that. Uh huh. I was called up by the principal, the principal, and said, Your father owed too much money to this school. I would like you to leave. I shook his hand and I left. Uh huh. That was age. Fourteen. No, boss, you were older than that. Fifteen maximum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My wife does the same thing. Call me a lie all the time. <laughs> For one one week, you know. One week. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, mm-hmm. I said, well, 
Edmund is in school too, so I walked into class and I picked up Edmund. And I didn't come. Picked him up and we both walked out. We took the train and we walked right here. We arrived here at Apas at one night. Really? Yeah. And well, not thinking that the pair, that your parents going to, it'd be hurtful to relate the story to the parents, yes. but I did. Yes. Not thinking what reaction it have. And that was that. Uh huh. And I roamed the savannah here for a year until the um, exams came in May or June. And somebody got in with the priest and said, well, at least let him sit the exam. Mm -hmm. Well, I sat the exam. But I didn't go back, I didn't go back to the school. Mm -hmm. And that was that, that was the end of my school life. Yes. Unpaid school bills were a sign of the times. Many estates were heavily mortgaged and were foreclosed by the banks. Gradually, from the 1920s on, estate life was on the wane. But for Basil de Verte, Coco was in his blood and remains an important part of his life. After many years working in the oil fields, he has returned to running an estate. To stand in the dappled light of a cocoa field is to understand Basil's love of cocoa. But all is not poetry here. There are many practical matters to pay attention to. What I'm doing here is just looking around like we normally do on an estate to see what destruction we have. This is one which is called Witch's Broom. This is a green one. But then when it gets to this stage, what we do is hack him off, leave him there. In the old days, we used to burn, not necessary any longer. Other than that, we have thrips, which attacks the young leaves, draws on the, on the, on the food that comes into the leaves, and, uh, but other than that, what we do is to trim every single year, we trim the entire estate to open up the top a little bit and to give space inside and keep the trees clean and wait for the crop. The crop comes in in November and uh, ends usually in around June, July for the latest, and then we start trimming again. It's a replica from year to year without fail. And without trimming, you will not get the results. If running a cocoa estate is more and more a thing of the past, so is the French language. In the 19th century, French was the dominant language of the social classes in Trinidad. The daily newspaper was published in French as well as in English, and services at the downtown church of the Holy Rosary were held in French. Children of wealthy planters went to France for higher education, and the two main schools in the island, St. Mary's and St. Joseph's, were French. Anthony Trollope, the British writer, didn't know quite what to make of this. He wrote in 1859, As Trinidad is an English colony, one's first idea is that the people speak English, and one's second idea, when that other one, as to the English, has fallen to the ground, is that they should speak Spanish, seeing that the name of the place is Spanish. But the fact is that they all speak French. And up to not so long ago, some households maintained their Frenchness quite well. Now, uh, your grandmother was from Martinique. She was, yeah. Yeah, she, she married my grandfather, I think, when she was very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kept very close contact with Martinique. In fact, my father and his siblings were educated in Martinique. The Frenchness of the house was all around you. The books were French. Uh, there was Paris Match there. I remember vividly to being fascinated that, that the French novels, you had a, a paper knife to slit the pages because for some reason they weren't cut, you know. So when you were reading, you'd sit with this knife and go zoop. So you could turn <laughs> the page. the page, yes. yeah. 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 I remember that well. But um, Papa Jean uh, on the estate spoke Hindi. I mean, I, I, heard, I, I could hear him speaking Hindi with, the, the, you know, the people in the barracks because most of the estate workers lived in the barracks attached to the estate itself. Uh -huh. Even though there was the Hindi aspect, I mean, nearly everything was French. But more and more it became a challenge to keep French alive. The two Degan sisters, Madeleine and Antoinette, 
remember well their grandmother's attempts. Well, to begin with, they only spoke French to each Both other. Both of them? Yes. Mm -hmm. To each other and expected us all to speak French too, which we never did. I remember um, my grandmother would come and give me a long message for, grand for my mother, go and tell your mother whatever it is, so and so, so all in French. And I understood it all right, so I'd go and tell my mother, Grandma is going to church tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, Mom, would you like to go? And she'd tell me, yeah, she'd love to go. And so I'd go back and tell Grandma this. I'd speak to her in English, and she'd say to her, Mommy would be very glad, and she'd come in and get ready to go with you. And she said, she put her fingers like this, and she said, Papa, le dessert, je ne comprends pas. <laughs> in other words, she didn't understand what I was saying, so I must say it in French. Yeah. So I tried to struggle through, you know. I really, we, we never took it up. It's a shame because our four grandparents spoke nothing but French to each other and to us. But then most of, of the Degans were educated in England. They all went away. And Daddy never spoke French to us, I don't think. No, he couldn't. They spoke to each other. To my parents? Yeah. When they didn't want to know what was going yes. on. Yes. <laughs> Goldie used to yeah. say, I know when I'm going to have a dose of casserole because they speak French to each other. And back at the Coco estate, in the days before telephones, you got your messages in French. And what about um, getting news from town, from say something, somebody needed to well, send you a message or something? The um, police station had a telephone. Uh huh. And the police took the message. God, remember the name of the man? And they had this old patois, he spoke patois, the man. Yes. And they would give him a note. Suppose any note was coming here, he would start shouting from the bottom of the hill, Madame, Madame, mauvais nouvelle, mauvais nouvelle. <laughs> <laughs> this time he didn't have a clue. <laughs> he was a pessimist. Yeah. He was always and mauvais that is how we got, um, That's how we got our news. Yes, oh, No lovely. telephone, no yeah. nothing. Yeah. And that is how, by the little notes. Yes. <laughs> from the police station. Oh, great. They spoke French to the estate workers, and out of this came patois, once widely spoken, now heard only in isolated pockets of the island, like Paramin, high up in the hills above Port of Spain. This is the house of Mr. Romani, who's talking with his son and with his friend, Mr. Joseph. it's hard to get young people to learn how to speak. You see what I'm trying to tell him? He ain't want to learn to speak Patwa. But, you see? So he will never learn. His children. His children grow up with their grandmother, with his, with his mother, and some of them might speak patois for you, but there is nothing you will tell them in patois and they can understand. They know it because the grandmother teach them. And you see now, it's easy for a child to learn to speak patois. Take for instance, like this is rice here now. I will tell him now, I'll say, um, excuse me. I will tell him now, I'll say, um, I'll call him, he ain't know what is that, but I know his rice. I'll tell him, Garçon, point de ouïe à la bas moins. He might watch at me. Point de ouïe à la bas moins. So I'm showing him. So he know definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That right. is what I tell him. When he open it, he'll see his rice. So he should know next time when I tell him. Point de ouïe à bas moins. He should know definitely his rice are speaking about. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that hard to learn, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not something. Patois is something very easy. The hardest language having the whole is English, you know. That's mm -hmm. true. Yes. The hardest word is English. But Patois is not something hard. But you see now the children and them now. They find that yeah, Patois yeah, yeah. is, 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 is broken language now. They don't want to speak that. But it dying now. The people from abroad come in here now. And that is what they come into here now and they're here in it. Port of Spain is easy to get to now by Jeep. And with increasing assimilation comes an ease with English that makes Patois the language of old people. Yeah, 
It's a special event for parishioners in Paramin to have their Mass said in Patra by a visiting priest from St. Lucia on the Sunday before Carnival. This Mass took place on the Sunday before the annual pre-Lenten Carnival, which is itself a legacy of the French Creoles. Carnival has its unmistakable origin in French Catholic tradition. In the past, Catholicism defined the French presence, marking it as separate and distinct from that of their fellow Europeans, the British colonials, who were largely Protestant. To be Catholic was, in the 1800s, a strong political statement. In the early stages of the 19th century, there was a lot of cooperation between the Anglican Church and the Catholic Church. There's even a recorded the Anglican Church raising money for the lepers and then handing it over to the Catholic priests who cared for the lepers in Laventille. But unfortunately, and I suppose rather sadly, that began to change. We had 1844. The Anglican Church became the established church in Trinidad and Charles William Warner, who was essentially an Englishman and with a very strong will and determination. And um, he was the chief influence in engineering opposition between the Anglican Church and the Catholics. And therefore it's only with his removal from office in 1870 that relations began to improve somewhat. So you had a very bad period of conflict between the churches between 1840 and 1870. After that, things began to improve again. <laughs> 